I thought today um, to speak about a sutta called the Anuruddha Sutta, and it's Anguttara Nikaya, the numbered discourses, 8.30. And in the discourse, uh, Venerable Anuruddha, who is one of the chief disciples of the Buddha, uh, remembered specifically for uh, his ability with the divine eye, um, speaks uh, of, in meditation, the thought arises to him, this Dhamma is for one who is modest, not for one who is self-aggrandizing, aggrandizing. This Dhamma is for one who is content, not for one who is discontent. This Dhamma is for one who delights in seclusion, not for one who delights in entanglement. This Dhamma is for one who arouses their energy, not for one who is idle. This Dhamma is for one with mindfulness established, not for one with muddled mindfulness. This mind, or this Dhamma, is for one who, whose mind is concentrated, not for one whose mind is scattered. This Dhamma is for one endowed with discernment, not for one who is undiscerning. And after he has these thoughts, uh, these seven qualities of one who is attuned to the teaching and the path, the Buddha uh, appears to him and says, uh, Good, Anuruddha, but you should also add that this Dhamma is for one who delights in non-proliferation, not for one who delights in proliferation. Non-proliferation is nipapancha in Pali, and proliferation is papancha. So, it's a comprehensive list. And the sutta goes on to detail and explain each item in it. So when Venerable Anuruddha has the thought, this Dhamma is for one who is modest, not for one who is self-aggrandizing, He's, he says, this is so it was said, and with reference to what was it said. There is the case where a monk being modest, does not know, want it known I am modest, where a monk being content with little does not want it known I am content with little, where a monk seeking seclusion does not want it known I seek seclusion, where a monk with energy aroused does not want it known I have energy aroused, and so on through all the qualities. And there's an interesting... Uh, aspect of the Pali here, where one, uh, the Pali for modest, I've heard also translated as one with little wishes, and because the compound in Pali means small wish, but it also might mean wish to be small, so it can uh, be construed as both. And this is something that I saw in a very beautiful way in Thailand. Longpur Liam, um, the current head of the Ajahn Chah tradition and abbot of Wat Nampapong, Ajahn Chah's successor, is renowned for his modesty. Um, he, there's stories of new monks ordaining and um, 
one specifically. Um, I believe he was just had ordained a few days earlier and was doing some work project, cleaning up trash around the monastery and saw this old monk walking by. And in Thailand, there's a tradition of after a man uh, or a woman has done their duty in life uh, in the lay world, has raised a family, held a job, they'll go off to a monastery and spend the last years or decades of their life in robes, having ordained. It's a beautiful tradition. I think it's far less suffering than trying to spend that time on a beach, you know, drinking pina coladas or something. Um, and this new monk saw, so what you have are many elderly monks wandering around the monastery who actually have just ordained. Um, they're called long taz. And so this new monk, who was very, fairly young, saw this old long ta uh, wandering by um, and assumed he was one of these sort of uh, elderly monks who had just ordained and called him over and was directed him to help him out with picking up the trash or doing whatever task it was. And, you know, immediately the elderly monk got down and just helped him out. And um, soon other monks began to walk by and furtively looked around and began picking up trash with this new monk as well until there was a huge group of monks all doing this menial task together. And the new monk was obviously confused as to why suddenly there was, you know, 10 or so monks all doing the same small thing. And then he learned that the Long Ta he had called over to help him was in fact Long Por Liam, the abbot and head of over 300 monasteries around the world. And uh, Ajahn Liam's known for this in, in many uh, other cases. He's always um, helping out with the smallest tasks. He keeps a small Ziploc bag in his pocket where he, whenever he sees trash around the monastery, he'll stop and pick it up. And he'll uh, work with uh, all the the others in the monastery to do small construction tasks and things like this. Additionally, he uh, was known for, in his uh, early and later years, he had more energy than any of his assistants, uh, which was quite difficult for his assistants. Uh, it's what a, in the monastic life is called an upatak. Um, and as an upatak of a senior monk, you're expected to be there half an hour before they wake up, preparing everything to help them with all these little things. It's a beautiful training in humility, um, but it can be exhausting, uh, especially if it's long poor Liam that you're upatakking because he just doesn't stop. So what he took to doing was instead of sleeping in his kuti, he would always sleep below it in a small uh, mosquito net tent just to set an example for the other monks, even as a senior ajahn, even up to the present day, I believe, at least for many seasons of the year. And uh, what would frequently happen, and I've known monks who have upatalked him, would, he would, would be that he would at after working all day and receiving guests all day, he would uh, dismiss his upatak and go down to his small mosquito net below the kuti, um, the hut. And this would be the implicit permission that the upataks could go rest. But then as soon as they went and rested, Long Porlim would come out again and go off into the elsewhere in the monastery and keep on working. So monks would stumble across him over, uh, I know one particular instance where they found him in the middle of the night uh, repairing a broken pipe in uh, Ajahn Chah's old hospital kuti. Uh, and he told no one. Um, they only found out uh, later after one monk had spied him doing this. And this was routine that uh, he would sort of go under his kuti into his little umbrella tent and allow the out of compassion, his assistants to go rest, and then he would just keep on going. So such humility is uh, very inspirational, and 
also Ajahn Longpur Liam, uh, this ethic speaks to the power of a mind that is imbued with samadhi. Um, it people with uh, significant degrees of unification of mind don't need nearly as much rest as the rest, and that can be intimidating when you're assigned to be their assistants. So that's one of the better examples I know of modesty. And the next quality is uh, this Dhamma is for one who is content, not for one who is discontent. And I think uh, Ajahn Liam is obviously a very good uh, example of this uh, as well, but so are many uh, monks I know and uh, practitioners. And I think it's one of the important aspects of having renunciance in a culture is they really point to how little uh, one needs to, to be happy and that it's a huge burden off of the mind when one can simplify in that way. Um, I know there's a new movement uh, around Japanese minimalism that's becoming popular, and I think uh, there's good reason. Um, I think the Buddha beat them to it by about 2,600 years, but uh, the Buddha frequently compared the ideal state of a monastic to a bird with only their uh, wings uh, to take with them. And one important practice that we take on as monastics, especially in the Thai forest tradition, is that of Dutanga or Tudong, which is where you walk um, out from your monastery. Um, and we can't handle money, we can't store food, and we can't ask for anything other than water. So every morning uh, you, you walk and it's completely on faith. And every morning you just have to hope someone stops and uh, gives you something to eat. And in Thailand, this is easy enough. Uh, there's so much faith and the culture understands. But uh, doing Tudong in the West is a whole other level of adventure. And uh, I've done several periods of Tudong, uh, several weeks. I walked from um, about a week or 10 days outside of Melbourne, Australia, uh, outside, of, or outside of Sydney, a few days outside of Melbourne. I walked to about a week with Ajahn Kovilo from uh, near San Francisco to Abayagiri. And uh, my most recent long Tudong was uh, from outside of L.A. to Ajahn Jeff's monastery. And the um, magical thing is that it works. Uh, so the on my Tudong from L.A., the bus, the Greyhound dropped me off at the wrong bus station, which for most people would just mean a $5 bus ticket to where they needed to go. It was about 20 miles from where I uh, planned to end up. But since I have no money and can't ask for things, um, it meant two days extra walking and um, not knowing if you'd eat. Um, and yet those two days, uh, during those two days walking, I, um, well, first I got off the bus, uh, right before I had my sort of uh, the midday point where we can no longer consume food. And a uh, Thai woman came out of nowhere with a, an entire meal for me. <laughs> and um, I had to eat it in, in about five minutes, uh, which I don't think looked terribly inspiring. But uh, it was one of countless instances over the next week where people came out of the woodwork um, to uh, offer things. A Catholic mother and her child and her daughter stopped their car and, and uh, just brought me a meal. Um, I was had been hiking all night after uh, sleeping on the side of, uh, of the road. I couldn't find a sleeping spot for a long time. And um, 
at, at another day and just sort of stop by this one donut shop outside just to rest. And the owners were, I believe, uh, Burmese and um, just uh, gave me an entire meal. And people were very skeptical on monks coming to the West if uh, and, and, and nuns if it, something like this could be done. And Ajahn Shah always reflected, there's good people everywhere. Um, and uh, it, it works. A spiritual resonance can allow uh, even something as strange as this practice of wandering to to bear fruit. And it's a beautiful way of remaining content with little. Because usually on one of these walks, you won't get enough to eat some days. And yet you realize how little you need. Um, and we have a monastic in our tradition named Tan Pamuta who spent three years of his life wandering on the East Coast um, with, uh, with nothing. And um, I'm always reminded of a story of a saint um, who in medieval Italy left her very wealthy family to join the Desert Fathers she'd heard of uh, in uh, the East. And she snuck out in the middle of the night with just one coin to buy bread. And she heard a voice in her head that said, do you put your faith in a coin or in me? And she said, in you, Lord, and dropped the coin and left. And that level of surrender that comes with true contentment and, and having faith that this path, if we practice well and keep morality, will provide all we need is uh, a huge support. And sometimes we don't know that it will provide for us until we take that leap of faith. Um, and yeah, as Ajahn Pasano says, wisdom will take you to the edge, but sometimes faith is what lets you jump. And... Uh, I think it can be really useful to put ourselves out there at times to feel how we are held in the Dhamma. Um, if, if we have purity of heart and intention, the world rises to meet us. There's a lot more stories from Tudong. Perhaps that's another talk. But uh, we have another few qualities to move through. So that might be enough for now on that. The next uh, quality is this Dhamma is for one who delights in seclusion, not for one who delights in entanglement. And um, this is expanded on in the sutta by saying that uh, a monk is approached by uh, kings, ministers of states, uh, monks, nuns, lay people, sectarians and their disciples, and with his mind bent on seclusion, uh, converses with them only uh, until they take their leave or only as much as is necessary. And it can sound a bit dour at first, but what I, uh, the lesson I take from that instruction is just the fact that as we practice more and more, we do begin to savor seclusion and realize the peace and well-being that can be found in that space. And ironically, when we begin to step back from full-bodied engagement with the world is, strangely enough, when we finally gain access to the world again. Because when we step back from this constant engagement, we have a chance to cultivate an inner re refuge and an inner center. And we don't need to lean on and feed off of our relationships with others in the same way. Which means that we actually can enter into a true relationship uh, with a vow uh, as uh, certain philosophers would put it, rather than with uh, another it, with an object, um, which is so frequently how we treat 
others, even subconsciously. So although people who have not embarked on this path might see the stepping back from social engagement by one who has begun to practice as a form of stepping back from the world, what they don't realize is because we live in a hall of mirrors so often, looking to others only for what they can provide for us in terms of our own needs and wants, is that when we do manage to step back a little bit, just enough to cultivate some internal refuge, that's when we can actually interact with the world as it is and truly touch others rather than just shadows of ourselves and our compulsions and our projections and our desires. So ironically, seclusion is tied directly to intimacy. The next quality is this Dhamma is for one whose energy is aroused, not for one who is idle. And my sense is, for me, Meister, no, David Stendhal Rost said that the antidote to exhaustion is not rest, but full-heartedness. Or wholeheartedness. And I think that's accurate. I think one of the reasons we find ourselves so tired is not because we don't have energy in us, but rather that we dilute and scatter our purpose. And give ourselves to a thousand things that aren't worthy of ourselves. And that as we channel more and more of our efforts towards this life and towards a goal, the purification and complete awakening of the heart, that we gain a huge amount of energy that comes with knowing we have purpose. And I remember this trend in myself um, in my final year of college or years of college is I really began to feel that steadily, steady crusting over of experience which comes with the decades to the point where all the freshness goes out of life. And I lived a good life and yet I also felt that vague queasiness inside that told me that it wasn't completely worthy of what I was meant to do. And so I, I found that I was trying to juggle many balls at the same time and um, various relationships, social meetings, uh, outdoorsmanship, uh, music, a, a hundred things. And um at some deep level, I was exhausted, and those subtle points in my life, which were really the most important things, um, my love of writing, my love of practice, um, real conversation with people, I was able to do them to some extent, but you could also feel the heart being drained off in various directions, and how this compromised me at some deep level. And only when I um, really entered into the life that I felt I was meant to live in Dhamma, and for me that happens to be, I believe, a life in robes, though I don't think it's that for everyone, only then did I sense a root that was worthy of all my love, all of my heart. And it felt like falling in love with that life, with this stream of Dhamma. And that's where energy comes from, I believe. Uh, it's as if when we bring ourselves in line with what we are meant to do, with our highest purpose and aspiration, with our best selves, then we resonate uh, 
with that like a string tuned to the note of some much deeper um, or larger instrument. And when that resonates, you resonate as well. And that concordance provides huge strength and resources. So I find that if one can orient one's life on the correct course, then energy arises of its own. And I think that can come down to very simple acts of shedding that which is not necessary in life. Um, and uh, speaks to the quality of simplicity we've already touched on. So various relationships that you just realize aren't feeding you in the same way they used to. Um, sometimes letting those drop off and really consolidating life down to its most simple, potent core uh, is important. And recollecting death is a really important way to separate the grain from the ch uh, the chaff, the chafe, the grain from the dust. Um, Uh, the next quality, the fifth, I believe, is this Dhamma is for one who is mindful, not for one of muddled mindfulness. And it expands by saying uh, there's the case where a monk can call to mind, uh, is mindful, meticulous, can call to mind things said and done long ago uh, and teachings learned long ago. And for me, this speaks to the fact that right mindfulness at its heart is the ability to remember a framework of the teachings and bring that to every moment of experience. And specifically, uh, and perhaps most powerfully, the framework of the Four Noble Truths and of the Four Right Exertions uh, to cultivate wholesome states that have not yet arisen, to strengthen wholesome states that have arisen, to abandon unwholesome states that have arisen, and to prevent unwholesome, unarisen states from coming into the mind. And what I believe our culture is experiencing now in this generation is an enormous crisis in meaning the supports we had to orient life and to provide a canopy of meaning against the existential anxiety of life, of death. Um, those systems of religious thought have been completely uprooted along with so many of the other supports which provided a similar canopy of security and meaning, such as community, um, family structure, uh, a feeling of our place in the world. And that can be unbelievably painful. And I believe it can lead to some of the cultural polarization we see because without those canopies of meaning, uh, people lean on ideology and forget themselves. And I believe this is one of the true powers of the Dhamma, is that it can provide an overlay of meaning once again for us. Uh, it provides a framework in which every action is taken as um, what the Buddha phrased as an ornament of the heart. Every action is taken in service and of the path and as an embodiment and expression of intention and a chance to shape and refine our intentions towards their highest potential of love, of caring, of renunciation, of non-harmfulness, of purifying the heart. And because intention and the mind are taken as paramount, with clear structures surrounding them and a clear aim, then even the most mundane life 
suddenly becomes infused with meaning once again. And that holds us. And this is the essence of what mindfulness does, is if we can maintain that center, then everything becomes just one wedding stone to sharpen the knife of our discernment against. Um, becomes one more opportunity to shape ourselves into vessels of compassion. But to maintain that center of mindfulness, we do need a daily practice. And only with that do we have the stability of mind to bring that canopy of meaning, that overlay of purpose onto our lives. And without that, then then life in some sense is, is unbearable um, and is a connected of a, a series of disconnected and purposeless events, but with a framework of, te of the teachings and of a purpose of purifying the heart, then all things maintain and gather significance. Um, I'm reminded of one movie uh, I saw. Um, it was a terrible movie about samurai um, as a layperson. I saw it. And in it, the teacher of one student meets him after many years and uh, asks him to do a mock fight with him uh, with wooden swords. And the student responds that he wants to save his strength for a real battle, an important battle. And the teacher responds to him by saying, there are no important and unimportant things. All, all acts are equally important. And I thought that was very true in that frequently it's the smallest interactions or meetings or actions which shake us and change us. And we never know which those are. So maintaining mindfulness throughout every day and lending that significance of attention to every moment allows the transcendent and the path to emerge from even the most mundane life. The sutta then goes on to say that this dhamma is for one who's discerning, not for one who is undiscerning, or one whose mind is concentrated, not for one whose mind is unconcentrated. And uh, it then goes on to detail uh, a monk who is possessed of the four jhanas, or uh, refined states of concentration, of unification of mind. And... The Buddha really singled out this aspect of the path, saying that um, the path is one of concentration and the other aspects of the Eightfold Noble Path, such as uh, right view, right intention, right speech, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right effort, um, etc., are uh, requisites of right concentration. And as we learn to quiet the mind and cultivate these internal states of serenity, one does realize how powerful a resource it is. Not only in that it provides one with a huge well of well-being, a huge... Uh, resource of well-being internally that one can then give to others and which prevents one from needing to feed and demand of others. But also the still mind has the ability to see clearly into experience because it doesn't need to be, it's not threatened by it. And this is something that only comes with practice, I believe, uh, is, is the real ability to see how powerful the still mind is and that this slowly allows one to cut through delusion in one's life. And I, I mentioned this uh, in a previous talk, but sometimes it might just be 
phrase as so simple as uh, stop and look. Um, concentration and insight, samatha and vipassana. Just stop and look. Which brings us to the seventh aspect. Uh, this dhamma is for one who's discerning, not for one who's undiscerning. Uh, one who has wisdom, panya. And thus it was said, with reference was to what was it said, there's the case where a uh, monk, and this could mean any practitioner, um, is endowed with discernment, noble, penetrating, leading outwards, or leading onwards, perceiving ari the rising and passing away of phenomena. And I think there's something very counterintuitive here in that when one perceives the impermanent nature of everything that surrounds one, then there's a huge strength in that, actually. Although it can destabilize one, at some deep level, I believe the heart knows from the very beginning that external conditions are not a reliable refuge. And so it's destabilized from the very beginning in that. So to realize that consciously and to slowly ease one's white-knuckled grip on those shifting conditions as a refuge, while also cultivating these much more stable uh, resources such as concentration or purpose, is actually a huge relief. And also that... I believe it's a bit like drawing back the veil from the face of reality. And when one's directed to look at the shifting and insubstantial nature of so many of the things we rely on, it can seem like a loss, but when did the bridegroom ever mourn the moment that he draws back the veil and sees his love's face. And that's what I see discernment as, in part, is it's drawing back the veil. And so it, it, there's actually a great gain. It's just that what we gain is harder to articulate than what we're letting go of. But... I think there should be no mistake that if one is cultivating this path in a balanced way, then when one releases their grip a little bit on these external conditions by seeing their transitory nature, that there is something else that one gains, a deeper sense of well-being, a purpose, and eventually awakening. And the final aspect that the Buddha spoke of was this Dhamma is for one who delights in non-proliferation, not for one who delights in proliferation, Nipa Pancha. And the Pancha is traditionally thought of as the uh, way that a single impression or perception will spread and compound and turn back on one. Um, and is predicated on the concept of one being the uh, a solid subject of experience, a solid self behind the thinking mind. Um, so to give an example, if one uh, fails at something small, and then suddenly the thought arises, I always fail in this way. What will they think? This is just like that one time. And suddenly... Uh, one has entered into an entire new realm uh, and what started as a small perception or a small event turns on one and grows. And this is proliferation. And non-proliferation, which is a term that's not usually spoken of, uh, at least 
not that I've heard of very often. Um, Ajahn Jeff has said it could be translated as uh, purity of heart, or I believe Kierkegaard said, uh, spoke of, obviously not in this context, but of willing uh, to will one thing. And for me, this speaks to how if we can avoid getting tangled in these proliferative qualities, that we have the ability then to keep our finger on that small, quiet thread or note of Dhamma that runs through every situation in life and follow it. And that when we do that, that our hearts move in line with their true purpose, with their highest purpose and highest aspiration and nature, um, or at least potential, perhaps not nature. Um, and that this is when we can let go of that sense of self that we're constantly working to crystallize in our lives because there's another way we have of orienting ourselves which is around that quiet voice and that subtle north star that guides us. I think that's enough. It took a lot longer than I thought it would. Sorry. <laughs> um, maybe I'll choose suttas of smaller lists in the future or just talk about Tudong. Does anyone uh, want to discuss anything? Oh, the time listed for this is 1.50 a.m. Well, that's good to know. Sorry about that. Hmm. Well, I'm hoping it's streaming okay. I think, uh... Yeah, I'm not sure what was the deal with the time. I may have listed it wrong. Apologies. Anyone, uh, have anything they'd like to discuss? Okay. Well, we can let it let rest for now. Um, Benny Bloodlust. Um, yes, the Pali. Yeah, this is the Anuruddha Sutta eight dot thirty. Uh, so I did learn it in English mostly, but many of the, uh, most of the Pali terms uh, for those are fairly uh, important poly terms. So I, I know most of most of those eight, like Nipa Pancha or Papancha is a very important term. And the others are things like uh, Panya, Samadhi, so fairly standard. Okay, Karina. Um, how would a lay person hold these qualities differently than a monastic? That's a really good question. I think the essence of it is the same, but I think it can be very difficult as um, in, in, in lay life to I know my parents and many people I know who've embarked farther and farther in the path have felt that difficulty of straddling two worlds and negotiating 
uh, comma and duties that come with the lay life uh, while also becoming more and more sensitive to what a life dedicated completely to the Dhamma would mean. But I think it, it is a false dichotomy in some sense um, in that Buddha Dasa, who was a very famous monk in Thailand of the last century, said uh, that Dhamma is duty. And I think that the beauty of the Dhamma is that it shows us that in every situation, there's always a path of purity, always. Because an arahant can exist in any situation and conduct him or herself completely purely. And my sense is that especially as we develop the sense of intuitive awareness, usually located more in the body, which is why breath meditation is so helpful. It reacquaints us with the somatic sense and where the chitta, the mind heart lives, that we gain the ability to follow that voice. And, and this is the importance of having that daily practice of meditation is that if we can really bring that level of mindfulness to life and approach every situation as an, a chance to cultivate the heart, then even those external conditions which initially seem counter to what we idealize as a life of completely being dedicated to the Dhamma, um, you know, the, the job that's not perfect, the relationship which uh, always works against one a little bit, it feels actually can become part of the practice and exactly what one needs to do. Um, and yeah, if everything in life is taken as a teaching that way, which takes a huge presence of mind to do, then wherever one is, uh, I think all of these qualities can be cultivated um, just like they would be for a monastic. But obviously there are some practicalities as well in terms of really being willing to lay down, to go against the world, to lay down relationships and duties which one begins to feel aren't conducive, and to being willing to, to be willing to bear with the friction which one feels with, with these duties a little bit, because it does seem like there's, there's some painfulness as one tastes the fresh sweetness of a life of Dhamma, and realizes that certain aspects of one's life don't align with it completely. And Ajahn Chah said that 80% of the practice is, or at least half of it, is knowing that we should let go of something and not being able to. And just having compassion for ourselves as we continually feel the scalding nature of certain aspects of our life and, and that that's what's necessary to learn to let go of those things is to just be burnt again and again to an extent um, and that we aren't always good at letting go right away but that if we just steadily incline the mind and heart towards this life of simplicity then that that eventually will guide us gently towards where we need to be um, and uh, just having patience with that I think it's a difficult situation um, but also guiding our lives by those most significant moments of clarity um, where you really feel that golden light come and really feel like you've found the footstep made for you and not forgetting that, putting a strong flag in it and using Aditana can be very helpful to guide your life by that using sort of commitments. Um, you know, so for example, uh, like being a monastic. Um, I don't always feel like it, but uh, most of the time I do. I really like this life, but uh, yeah, having that as part of it. And, and also to say that the Buddha actually laid down a huge number of um, a very robust form for lay people that I don't think people take full advantage of. Um, so putting aside one day a week for the Uposita or Sabbath day that's completely de dedicated to practice, holding the precepts, meditating as much as one can every day. Um, little things like this are, are not little. Uh, and 
they provide the structure that can let one really cultivate those eight qualities. Okay. That's enough, I think. I hope everyone's well. It's always a pleasure to tap into this community and I'm deeply grateful uh, for the chance. So 